In this interview, I talk with anabolic dog Jeffrey Rutterbush about his extensive knowledge and experience with performing enhancing drugs, better known as anabolic androgenic steroids. Enjoy. How are you? Fine. I'm looking forward to this. Please like and subscribe. Thank you. And hit that notification bell so you won't miss anything. Okay, so let's start off uh, with tamoxifen. What is tamoxifen exactly and what is it used for in bodybuilding, Jeffrey? Well, tamoxifen, I have a lot of experience with both as a user and a prescriber. It is a serum selective estrogen receptor modulator. Been around a long time. Um, it comes usually in 10 or 20 milligram tablets. So it's, it can be used in 10 or 20. The usual dose is either 10 twice a day or 20 once per day. It's a unique substance. It has anti-estrogenic effects in some tissues, but it has pro-estrogenic effects in others. And that makes it a very interesting, uh, I guess, drug that I've used. And let me tell you about my experiences with tamoxifen. Um, I grew up in the science of learning to use tamoxifen primarily for guys that had nipple sensitivity. And then I would add it to people who had nipple sensitivity, and it would work like a charm. So I would use it for short bursts. Um, until the nipple sensitivity was no longer an issue. Now, in testosterone optimization therapy, it's rarely really needed, but I do bring it out of my armamentarium for the occasional guy that has nipple sensitivity. And I can't reassure him by saying, just stick with this, you will outgrow that side of it. Nipple sensitivity is different than gynecomastia. So, let me tell you about the estrogen, though, the anti-estrogen effect. That's where in, in breast tissue it works very well. But in the liver, it has pro-estrogenic effects. So if I have a person that has, had a, has a bad lipid profile, I always found that both for myself and my patients, when I did put them on a course of tamoxifen, it would improve the lipid profile from the liver. So there it has pro-estrogenic effects in the liver, anti-estrogenic effects in the breast tissue. So it was a multiply variant uh, chemical, chemical substance drug I would use. Um, and that is the reason I used it for nipple sensitivity. Now, my own personal experience when I was really doing heavy doses, uh, I just threw it on board because of the anti-estrogen effect. It has some LH agonist activity. So that in and of itself would boost some testosterone. And so for about 10 years while I was doing heavy doses and heavy relative, probably 400 milligrams of testosterone uh, a week and a couple hundred milligrams of decadurable in a week. I was doing 20 milligrams a day of, of tamoxifen and I never had nipple sensitivity. So I didn't take it for that reason. I took it to prevent any type of nipple sensitivity or any type of nipple uh, gynecomastia that may occur. But I came across a lot of guys that had such a bad case gyno they needed surgery. So I thought, well, let me just go on this stuff. Plus, you know, I was a Navy doc. And it, I could just put myself in the computer and go pick it up at the pharmacy. So I did that for a lot of years with no side effects. But I do know from experience that I've written it for people with nipple sensitivity, and it has stopped that. And I do know it does have a good profile on, on, on lipid uh, lipids. In other words, I can imp imp improve a guy's HDL and, and decrease his, his LDL on tamoxifen. 
We all know that one of the side effects of almost any AAS, the negative effect on lipid profile. So I thought that was an added benefit, potentiate the stat I was on, minimize possibility of nipple sensitivity or gyno, and improve my, my, uh, my lipid profile. Because remember in the Navy, I had a physical every year. So I would track my H&H &H and my lipid profile, and I did see an improvement. It wasn't great improvement, probably 10 points on the HDL increase, and maybe 10 points lower on the LDL. But since heart disease runs in my family, I thought, well, what an added benefit. So I have for about 10, 15 years, Stephen, I was on tamoxifen. Currently, however, I am not. Mm -hmm. Because I was, I, was, I was big dosing, I was big dosing. But on my current you know, testosterone optimization program, I don't feel a need to use it personally. Okay, I understand. So for supraphysiological doses, it's an added benefit on the nipple sensitivity and the lipid profile, but with just regular TRT, uh, it won't be needed. And yes, are sir. there... In my clinical experience, I have found it, I have used it for guys on supraphysiological anabolic bodybuilding doses, but I don't feel a need to use it very much at all in my testosterone optimization guides. Okay, that's clear. And are there any side effects of taking tamoxifen? You know, I researched that pretty heavily, and I've been, I was on it for a long time. I think the, um, I was not able to come across anything that was long-term detrimental. I mean, you gotta understand, tamoxifen has been on, on the market for a long, long, long time. And in the bro science, uh, world has been used for many, many decades. When I was in, uh, sorry, when I was in uh, Germany, uh, Iceland, Kuwait, Middle East is big on. They use it routinely, and um, I was talking to some some doctors over there. I even got a hold of a doctor friend of mine I know here. That's the, a doctor, a anabolic doctor, we call him. He's not any aware of any long term detriments either. But again, what we've done a long-term longitudinal study of 20, 30, 40 years of people continuously dosing tamoxifen. Okay, that's clear. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. So let's go to the next question. Yes, so what is nandrolone, DECA? Uh, uh, yeah, again, I have a lot of experience with this medication myself, uh, both from the bro science and dosing. And I was probably on... 100 to 200 milligrams a week of nandrolone for 15 years. Maybe more, maybe 17 or 18 years. Um, Continuously? Yes, sir. Continuously. I never took a holiday. You're not talking cycles like most bros online do. Uh-uh. I was cruising. I was cruising on these doses for almost two decades. I'm still alive and feel great. Okay, so and what is the main purpose in bodybuilding? It's it, it's one of the most powerfully anabolic and minimally androgenic hardening, cutting and uh, anabolics out there. Um, you know, have nandrolone, you have nandrolone decanoate or, or deca D. It has, the, one of the things I like about it is that it's a high anabolic effect, low androgenic effect, virtually no estrogenic effects. Um, it does, however, uh, it can, it can at high doses cause gyno. So usually that's why I was on the tamoxifen. And I always subscribe for my guys who are on high doses. It does have a negative effect on the lipid profile. But again, that's why I would like adding it to my guys on high doses, because of, I mean, sorry, the tamoxifen, because that would help with balancing the lipid profile. Um, one of the um, most powerful stacks, you probably heard the word stack, uh, decadurabulin and D-ball stack, been around forever. Now, what is the usual dose of deca 
well, two to 400 milligrams. In my travels around the world, two to 400 is the average dose. You can do a little less. We'll talk about that a little, a little later down the line here. Some guys do more. I know guys are doing six to 800 milligrams of DECA every week, in addition to two or 3,000 milligrams of testosterone. Yes. That's a right. Two or 3,000 milligrams of testosterone weekly with six to 800 milligrams of DECA Durabolin um, a week. And why are most people talking about cycles and are you talking about decades? Yeah, no, I, I've taught, now these are cycles. These are guys who are doing cycles. But you know, the more a guy stays on anabolics and the more he feels good, the better results he gets, the, the less the off cycles get and the longer the cycles become to the point that nobody takes hardly any holidays anymore. That's why you talk about this cruising and blasting. Even got, I don't know anybody right now, nowhere I recommend anybody who's been on high doses or doing replacement therapy. I would not recommend anybody getting off. So that's a relative term where you blast and where you cruise. Um, I remember years ago, a blast dose is would be considered today a cruising dose. It's all coming, it's all relative, coming up. And cycles are, are, are long term. So when you talk about Blasting and cruising, I know we're getting ahead of it, but it's part of what we want to talk about today. Um, the usual cruising dose of Nandrolone is 100 milligrams a week. The blast dose is, as I said, two to 400 megs a week. But I've seen guys do upwards of six to 800 milligrams a week with no long-term detriment. All we watch for is the you know, hematocrit and hemoglobin. We look for mainly you know, uh, liver, uh, liver enzyme, and we watch lipid profiles. And that's the only thing I've had really watched for guys who are doing long-term blasting, cruising, call it what you like. The terms are relative today. One guy's blast, another man's cruise. One guy's cruise, another man's blast. What is the main downside of DECA? I have heard that it gives a lot of water retention, a lot of mass, but because of you hold up all the water in the muscles, uh, that's not real muscle tissue. Is that right? I have not found that to be the case for DECA. Personally, I did not experience that. I, I found, personally, I would retain more water on higher dose testosterone than I did with Decadurable. Now, you've heard of the famous Decadic. You know, the, 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 the fact that it would diminish your sex drive. I didn't experience that. For 15 years on high doses Decadurable, I had an, a significant drive that was never minimized. It's only when I tried coming off those higher doses, you know, give myself a holiday, that I would know as my libido crashed. Therefore, my off cycles were never off cycles. They were just cruising. I had to maintain some cruise dose so I wouldn't crash my libido. So I no, I have not found the high doses of DECA create water retention. It's just been my personal experience that you can get the the uh, the, uh, the DECA dick. And again, that wasn't not my personal experience, but I've had guys tell me, you know, they come in the gym and they tell me they have experienced it. Uh, you know, Stephen, there's so much that behind a man's erections. You cannot ever really, I think, thoroughly or completely blame one element for putting a man's libido in the dirt. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a complicated phenomenon. Mm -hmm. libido and sex drive yeah, I mean so. the endocrine disruptors there's the stress cortisol levels the nutritional intake there's sleep 
and there's attractiveness to your mate. There's spats all the time. There's financial duress. Kids, I mean, these things all come into play when it comes to your erectile function. So back to Nandalone, I never experienced it. And I never experienced significant water retention. Doesn't mean it, it, it doesn't occur. Just that I never experienced it. And most of my guys never experienced it. The only side effect that would, you would tell me about occasionally is the deck of dick. Okay, I understand. Um, and when you're taking Nandrolone or DECA, uh, is there always a base of TRT there or uh, do you call it a cycle of testosterone? Yeah, I would, I've known guys that have just solely, you know, uh, Nandrolone monotherapy. But no, I was always taking it with testosterone. Um, we're going to get to other things here. I like the other, like Trenbolone, Estanazolol, and Enavar, and Oxandolone, you know, 850s. We'll get there. But okay, yeah, the unique thing about this, this conference today, uh, Stephen, is that I looked at the list here. And I've got personal experience with all of them, except the Enavar. But I do, I have prescribed Enavar for mainly women and, and who don't want to retain fluid and gain, you know, uh, body fat. But, but I, but Enovar is coming on strong for the endurance lean athletes that want, it, want the muscle accretion but don't want the water retention. So we'll get there at the, near the end. But again, I don't have any experience myself taking Enovar. All the other ones we're going to discuss today, I have personally used. Okay. Thank you. So let's round this subject up of, uh, about uh, DECA. Thank you. So next question, let's start about um, Stanazolol. Stanazolol, okay. What yeah. is Stanazolol of, uh, or Winstrol? Uh, and uh, why is this compound used for in bodybuilding? Stanazolol has been around a long time, believe it or not. It's called Winstrol. You may hear it called Winnie V. Um, it's a derivative of, of DHT, dihydrotestosterone. I like it personally, because I've used it. And my, one of my mentors, Dr. Uh, Edward Lichten, who's written this nice textbook called The Textbook of Biodental Hormones, he really rants and raves on the use of nandrolone and stanazolol in older men and older women because he said that they both have anti-diabetic and anti-thrombolytic effects. So again, I learned about those decamanely and uh, stenazolol through, you know, being taught by Dr. Edward Lichten. Um, it's the second most favorite oral steroid uh, worldwide, only behind D-ball, Dianabol, which is important. It, it doesn't get aromatized to estrogen which is important, but it will decrease HDL by about 33%, increase LDL by about 29%. So again, negative effect on lipid profile. The usual dose, 15 to 20 milligrams per day. Uh, most bodybuilders though, take a smaller amount and inject it usually, 50 to 100 milligrams every day or every other day. But I've known guys who go more than that. But again, it's a stack. I don't know any bodybuilders of use in as law alone as a standalone monotherapy. Okay. And um, is this one especially made for cutting, drying out? Well, being a, DH, being a DHT derivative, it has a very high end, uh, anabolic effects, very low androgenic effects. So it would be, be a good cutter, be a good covering that because it does not want to maintain you don't maintain fluid with this one. That's why Dr. Lichten puts in the same category as Anavar. He likes them two together as being good, good uh, cutting agents that you throw into a cycle to cut and, and get shredded and not maintain uh, you know, water weight on it. Mm -hmm. This so one, does... white, you may see it, Stephen, but you know, it's, it, that's the stuff that's kind of white, kind of a milky white. 
you shake it, it looks like milk in the uh, so it, it it's almost like a powder form in this fluid. So it's difficult sometimes to push it through a thin gauge needle because that white stuff will kind of clog up the end of the needle. So that's one of the drawbacks of uh, the injectable anazolol. Okay, but this one does not have a place in uh, hormone optimization, probably. Now, if you're looking at hormone optimization, you're looking at bioidentical hormones, and the only thing that's really justifiable is uh, testosterone. However, being trained by Dr. Lichten, he did like stenazolol and DECA durable in, in older men, usually 50, 55 and up, because of the... Uh, the uh, anti-diabetic and anti-thrombolytic effects that he spoke very highly of in his 2007 copyrighted manual I just showed you on the screen. A great read. Okay, let's uh, shift to the next one. A favorite of many, I guess. Uh, what is uh, Trenbolone? That's my favorite. And I'll tell you why. Why? Um, Trenbolone acetate. All right. First of all, it's never been approved for human use. It's a veterinary substance. But it's, it's derived from nandrolone, believe it or not. It's in the nandrolone family. So they're very similar, but yet not. Because if you read, do the research on, on trenbolone, it's non-estrogenic. So again, more anabolic effects, less androgenic than nandrolone. It doesn't aromatize, as I said, never approved for human use. Bodybuilders love it because it's a major cutting, hardening agent. In fact, there was a, I was on Trenbolone personally myself for about almost 20 years. And uh, the gains I made in strength were more phenomenal with Trenbolone as an add-on than anything else from the injectable. Now we're gonna talk about Anavar A50s a little later. That's the one that put more strength on me quickly as an oral form. But the one injectable that I thought was the most anabolic, least androgenic, and the biggest mass gainer for me, in addition to my testosterone, was the trenbolone acetate. Now, you can get this in injectable form, but, you can also you can also get it you can also get it and um, there was a company down in down in uh, Miami you could call one eight hundred go heavy one eight hundred go go heavy hold on a second no problem hey Mark I'll get back with you I'm on this I'm on this podcast. Bye -bye. Okay, boss man. Anyhow, so the unique thing about 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 Trenbolone is that you could buy it in, as Finaplex. You probably heard of Finaplex. Uh, they would take these canisters with little pellets, plastic canisters, with ten rows of ten pellets, so hundred per cartridge, and you could buy them. You could buy ten thousand pellets. 10 packs of 100 for about 350 to 450 going to front the market rate was. And they would send them to you and you could break the canister up and dump the little pellets into a little, you know, into a container. And I always found for, for almost 20 years, I would put those pellets under my, I would chew them, chew them up, pulverize them, and place them under my tongue for a sub, you know, a sublingual mucosal delivery system. And I gotta tell you, that's another delivery, another anabolic that when used in addition to testosterone, I would see my body weight go, once it kicked in, five to eight pounds a week. Five to eight pounds a week I would gain and my squat and bench press would go through the roof, through the roof. So again, the number one injectable for anabolic effects is muscle and muscle accretion is trenbolone. But again, you can get it as Finaplex, which they, they, they inject the little pellets in the ears 
of cattle. And since it was a veterinary substance, it wasn't controlled and you didn't need a doctor's prescription. You could call some guy down, hey, Seuss, or hey, down in Miami, and he would ship a, a, a box of it to you for whatever the going rate was that, that month or whatever. And like I say, for almost 20 years, I was on that stuff, sub, you know, sublingual. Our phone. And um, again, so it's my favorite. It's one of the favorite of global bodybuilders around, you know, because the Icelandic men love this one. But not a standalone as a great strengthening agent. That's why the, the, the phone number from Miami was 1 800 go heavy. Just go 1 800 go heavy, and they would ship as much as you wanted. <laughs> Can't get it anymore. No, I, I miss, I miss, I miss uh, speaking. You can get it, but they won't send you a box of a thousand. You have to pay. You have to get a box of a hundred, and it's like very expensive. So the price has gone through the roof. The volume, the quantity has gone down. But if you can get trenbolone acetate, and again, twenty years experience with this, forty years experience in the, in the gym, seeing guys do it. Never, I've never seen a guy have a bad outcome on trenbolone. One of the safest muscle accretion anabolics out there. And uh, always in combination with testosterone. Always. Okay. Again, it's been my experience. I've never done it with, you know, without testosterone as the base. Mm -hmm. But I remember you saying you uh, take uh, tamoxifen uh, always to be sure to, uh, for the lipid profile and so on. Um, why tamoxifen and not an uh, uh, aromatase inhibitor? Oh, well, we've had many talks, haven't we, about AIs, haven't we? I've never done an AI. Um, I've had patients come to me who were prescribed one milligram of Arimidix every day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And I've had guys come in, you know, twice a week. Now, we all know that in the top arena, there shouldn't be a place for AIs, Arimidix. But how about the muscle head, the, the big bodybuilding realm? Yeah, well, it's, it, it reached bro science momentum because of, of the guys doing heavy doses. But I never used it when I was on big doses of everything we spoke. I've never used it. I only used the tamoxifen. And I never had bad lipid profile. I never had gynecomastia. I, I never had, and I never had a decrease in my libido. So speaking for myself, I've never used the AI. I've, uh, guys use it for the, the, the big hit, the guys in the gym all the time, but I never did, never had to. And, you know, we, we do know of the, the negative consequences now in this group of AI. So I would tend to stay away from it and uh, just use the, uh, the tamoxifen personally between you and I. Because I, my, my experience with tamoxifen and my global experiences are with guys using tamoxifen and not AIs. Mm -hmm. I understand. And the hormone optimization, they always say, oh, stay away from the AIs. Uh, those are uh, used in the bodybuilding and the supraphysiological uh, testosterone. And even then you say you don't have to block the conversion. You just block the estrogen at the receptor with the tamoxifen. It, that's been my experience. Okay, so we don't know where that stems from. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's been my experience because I've learned it from other doctors around the world, you know, in different countries that they were recommended, guys who were in the bodybuilding industry way before I got into it in the, in, in the mid to late 60s were using tenocity. Okay, this is very uh, comprehensive for uh, trend balloon. So let's do the next topic, um, one that uh, is also very known. So what is boldenone or equipoise? Uh, it's a very known one. Yeah, I, I did a shorter course of uh, equipoise, uh, believe it or not, more recently, probably a decade ago for just about a year or two. So, you know, my experiences aren't as uh, extensive with equipoise. Um, I do know this. SIBA came out with that in 1949. 
So if they came out with D-ball uh, around the same time, early 40s, the, the, the structure of Diana Ball is very similar to the structure of, of, uh, of boldenone or equipoise. Uh, and I didn't know that until I did some research. But I do know this from being in the field and having experienced it myself. We all know that these anabolics all tend to increase H and H, hematocrit hemoglobin. But this one is known to really accelerate erythropoiesis. This is one you gotta watch out for. I know a lot of guys come in with elevated H and H, just short courses of equipoise. And they've been doing you know, doses of other anabolics for many, many, many years and didn't have the problem. They decided to throw equipoise on board and all of a sudden they've had hematocrits of 65 to 70. Yeah, 70. <laughs> that's dangerous. Uh, that's, that can be dangerous. Now, it doesn't have any liver toxicity. Uh, liver uh, Lipid profiles are negatively impacted like pretty much all the rest of the, uh, the anabolics. I have found that this equipoise, one of the problems I find with it personally and out there in the real world is that it takes a long time to kick in. It can take greater than eight weeks before you'll notice anything. So you gotta give it time to kick in, either as a standalone monotherapy or as a stat. You've gotta give it time. And in a lot of people don't have the patience to wait eight, 10, 12 weeks before it kicks in. They get frustrated and go off it. Uh, and I do know one other side effect that I've seen with this one. I don't know if it's just an anecdote. But I've had guys that come in and say that, man, they got nosebleeds. Uh, that's just, uh, just throwing that out there, saying H and H just go through the roof. Some guys get, get uh, nosebleeds uh, with equipoise. I know uh, equipoise. I know some professional athletes, collegiate athletes, that told me about the cycles of equipoise they've done. and some reason, there's been a myriad of them telling about the nosebleeds they've gotten with equipoise and the larger and you know, quicker elevation in H and H. So that's a downside right there. But it's been around for a long time. But again, I just told you my experiences and what I find out there in the real world. So and um, it, it um, gives uh, a lot of erythropoiesis. So uh, that that's good for endurance athletes then. Yes, it is. I mean, it could be. I mean, also, if you're going to bring H and H up, I mean, you think about it, you could also use it uh, as therapy for uh, uh, intractable anemia. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, um, again, equipoise, the problem with it is the H and H elevation rapidly and uh, the prolonged weight, you might say, as a stack to notice additional muscle accretion. Okay, but once it works, it's uh, a very lean muscle, I guess. Yes. And so once it works, it's a very good uh, stand. I mean, it's been around for a long time. I mean, what, 1949, I said. So it's been around a long time. And to date, I don't know of anybody who's died of these anabolics. Um, you know, I mean, we know as doctors, we hear people dying all the time of, of uh, having legitimate prescribed medications. You know, I mean, we all know the side effects of, of these meds we prescribe. I mean, Depending on what study you read, you get 100, 200,000 people die every year from the side effects of accurately prescribed synthetic chemicals. You don't hear about that much, but trust me, if the, if the uh, ignorant masses knew that the third to fourth leading cause of death in the United States would be side effects of synthetic chemicals, It'd be up in arms. Yeah, exactly. So back to boldenone. Um, well, because it kicks in uh, so late after eight weeks, as you said, um, it's something to stay on for much longer, probably. Yeah, I've known guys who were on boldenone for years, and like I, said, I gave it a year. Uh, I did notice it kicked in a little bit, and once it kicked in, it's a very continuous added muscle accretion. But yeah. you know. My history of being on the uh, Nandrolone prior to adding the, the Boldenone 
Plus, I just found, found that Nandrolone for me worked better. I had a longer history with it. I liked what it did to me personally. So I, I gave up on the Bolden. I understand. So, uh, just one last question. Uh, what's the typical dosage of Boldenone? 200 to 400 milligrams uh, per week injectable. That's the usual dose. I research it around the world. 200, 200 to 400 milligrams a week. Now, that's a quote. That's the bodybuilding doses, and that's stacked on to usually uh, an, a testosterone uh, and usually a good oral anabolic, which we're going to discuss here shortly, I think. Uh, maybe the next one. So that, that's dosage uh, 200 to 400? That's for boldenone? Yes, sir. Okay. I, I thought it would be uh, higher. Well, that's the average dose. Now, again, I run across people who've done six, eight, 100 milligrams, you know, double that dose. But the average dose for the average bodybuilder is about two to 400 in addition to their other elements and gear. Okay, let's uh, shift to the next one. Um, okay, what is oxymetolone um, or anadrol? Yeah, let me tell you about my experience with anadrol. First of all, A bomb, they call them A bombs. That's a DHT derivative. Um, it's the most powerful oral anabolic on the market, bar none. Um, the, the usual novice, novice that adds anadrol to their program. Actually, let me back up. The usual novice who goes on nothing but anadrol 50. Monothera. We'll gain 20 to 30 pounds in six weeks. <laughs> Tremendous. And let me tell you about my experience with Panadrol. The first time I ever went on a cycle, a legitimate cycle. Uh, testosterone, Decadurabolin, and Panadrol 50. And let me tell you something. You know anything about Dave or Dan Duchesne who's written the Underground Steroid Handbook? Even he will say in his book that that's the most powerful, common used stack amongst bodybuilders today. Now, so my first experience, now I was doing small doses. I was doing, like, I was taking the Anadrol 15, breaking it in the halves, and then, you know, for a week, and then a full dose for a week, and then a, uh, uh, another pill and a half. Or, so I was on an eight to, ten, eight to ten week cycle where I came, started low, came up, and then came down. Same thing with my uh, testosterone dose. Everything, on the very first cycle I did, everything started low, came up, and then I came down. So about 10 weeks. And I gained 40 pounds in eight weeks. 40 pounds, gained five, once it kicked in about three weeks, I saw the scale move five to eight pounds every week. I was amazed, thinking, wow. That felt great. <laughs> And I got really strong in the gym. I'm thinking, wow, I've never squatted 500 pounds again. Never squatted, never benched over 500 pounds. Now, 10 weeks out, I'm doing all these things the first time, thinking, phenomenal. So that's my first experience as, uh, going on a cycle was Androl 50, testosterone, and decadurable. Gained 40 pounds in eight to 10 weeks. People always worry about losing the gains when they stop, but uh, you, you have to come off uh, eventually. So how does that work uh, when you gain that, uh, that rapidly? I did. Let me tell you something. Back in the day when I first started this and gained that 40 pounds, I was told I need to go off. You know, so I said, okay, I'll start go off. It wasn't, but it only took me six weeks to lose 30 of the, of the 40 pounds. Now, again, you know, ten, the, the net gain is 10 pounds of, of muscle I didn't have when I started. But when you, you walk around and you feel strong, and all of a sudden you're coming down and, and you're thinking, wow, I don't want to do this. So I would, that's why my cycle became continual therapy. So yeah. I would blast and then cruise. I would never come off. My cruise doses would come down a little bit, but I would never go off. Never in 35, 40 years. 
webinar test last week. Yeah, we yeah. haven't we haven't talked about PCT post cycle therapy yet. Did you ever do that, or did you just? I Stephen, when I first went on anabolics, yes, I did go PCT. I did I did take holidays, um, but I got so frustrated with the, the losses. I, I you know the hard work that then I lose the gains, and then I go back on and I gain them uh, the muscle and strength back and then go off so over the first two years of being on anabolics as i said my my cycles became off, virtually again my off cycles became shorter my on cycles became longer so basically after two years i was cruising i was never taking holidays so for ba basically for and you're looking at 30 plus years i've been cruising uh now of course i just cruise at you know the testosterone optimization doses mm -hmm. okay that's it for uh, anadrol so let's go to the next one what is oxandrolone or anavar i have heard that is it is the one you should begin with if you haven't ever done anabolics i have been told or seen on the internet everywhere uh, that's the one with the least side effects and uh, that's the one you you break the water with is that you've, uh, been told, you've been told correct when i first entered the uh, this realm it was the one that women were known to take it was the least at anabolic in the women's doses to 2.5 up to maybe 10 milligrams a day uh, had the last, least androgenic effects. That's why women liked it. But they weren't getting the fat, and they weren't getting the fluid retention, they weren't getting hirsutism, you know, facial hair, and deepening their voices. So my first experience with it was, uh, believe it or not, was with women bodybuilding. Uh, and I've never, this is the only one I, that we're speaking about today that I've never, never been on. Um, I think, though, given what I've been on all the years, uh, I wouldn't probably make much gains on Anavar. Now the usual men's dose is usually 15 to 25 uh, milligrams, not the two to 10 that women are on. But I, I think that you, you, were, you were told right that if you're gonna start on one, start on this one. It's just like a stair-step approach. And because you can always step up to more powerful anabolics in your life. But if you start with a really heavy one, then, then step down, Anavar, I would think that you'd be disappointed with your gains. Now, I did find some research on Anavar. I didn't know about this. But they say milligram for milligram, milligram for milligram. That it's six times more anabolic than testosterone. So I didn't know that. So, But knowing that now, it's six times more anabolic than testosterone. I guess the manly dose it had to be a whole lot more than than the uh, two to ten. So uh, I know I've known of guys who've done fifty to a hundred milligrams of, of Anavar daily, and taking advantage of that six times greater potential of uh, anabolic effects. You know, therefore muscle accretion. And again, the endurance as a sportsman doctor, I have found that the women. And now the endurance athletes, the endurance athletes that want stamina, they want strength, but don't want the big time muscle accretion, don't want the added body weight, don't want the fluid retention, don't want the adiposity. They love Anavar. And it's one of the favorites, not just women, it's one of the favorite, favorites of the, uh, of the uh, endurance athletes. Mm -hmm. Any known side effects? Well, I think, again, like any other anabolic, you're going to have like any other oral, you're gonna have some liver toxicity, you know, because anything oral first pass metabolism, you're gonna have a, a negative effect on lipid profile like anything else. But no, um, in my research, um, if you do it like you're supposed to, you cycle on six to eight weeks on, you take a holiday, your blood work, the no long-term side effects. The side effects that we get into, that we see, are guys that do supraphysiological doses that don't see doctors regularly enough to have their lipids looked at, to have their H and H looked at. Those are the guys that run the problems. Mm -hmm. 
I got to tell you, Steve, you know what I mean? For 20 years, I was on these medicines, and I never did routine blood work other than the usual physicals. We just looked at my h and and lipid. I never checked testosterone, never checked my, my uh, PSAs, rather, never checked my estrogens, ever, ever, 20 years. And is that because you think um, that is necessary? Is that what you recommend other men, or are you just lucky? I, I, I wouldn't recommend that, but I'm just telling you because I was... Belong, I belong to somebody, the government, and I was going to admit to them that this, this massive doc they had was walking around doing all this stuff that you know, I, perhaps they suspected, <laughs> but I didn't show any of the signs and symptoms of uh, anabolic uh, uh, use. And, uh, and between you and I, when I gained that 40 pounds, I was in Puerto Rico, so I left at 220 pounds, came back in six months, I was 260. But it was such a gradual thing that the command saw it, and I got back and they said, man, Doc, you got pretty big. I said, I was with, I was with the Marines, and we just trained all day long. <laughs> I didn't tell them, well, my ergogenic aids, um, but yeah, for 20 years, I never did. Would I, would I recommend that? No, but I just didn't want to admit what I was doing to uh, the government. They say, they say, well, you can't be doing that. You shouldn't be doing that. Get off that. I, I said, so I never admitted. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Um, taking Anavar, would you recommend people uh, also to take the Tamoxifen? Again, if you can be on a long time and do big time doses, I would recommend tamoxifen as a preventative. If you're going to do the smaller doses, the recommended dose, and take holidays, I would stay off tamoxifen unless you have nipple sensitivity. But then again, as a preventative, I, I would, that's why I look at bloods now, because if a guy's got a bad lipid profile and I'm making it worse, on uh, Anavar, I'll just tell them, let's go do some low dose uh, tamoxifen and, and improve that lipid profile. And again, I told you, uh, tamoxifen has an, acts like an LH agonist. And so, you know, much like HCG, and it can increase testosterone production in, in, in endogenously. So, again, I've had great luck personally with using tamoxifen over the years. Um, I don't know where the, where the science stands now. Again, uh, what we do in TOT, it's not really considered part of hormone resto hormone restorative therapy. No, but in the anabolic good. world of, of you know, meat headology, yeah, I recommend using it. Okay. And you probably use it with all the substances that we have talked about, bold and yes, I would, but I think the, the least one, the one that would probably be the least likely to have to use it would probably be the Anavar. Okay, but all the others like the boldenone as well, the equipoise. Oh, yeah. Yes. You recommend the tamoxifen. Yes. Okay, and that's 10 milligrams. 10 to 20. Okay. And you can do it once a day, 20 milligrams once a day, uh, 10 milligrams once a day, 20 milligrams. I'm sorry, 10 milligrams twice a day. I always found it best to do it twice a day. Mm -hmm. For the half life effect, I take it morning and night, just 10 milligrams morning and night. Okay. I guess we covered all the substances that you told me that you have personally um, experience with. So uh, let's do the last questions uh, for this episode. So uh, what exactly is testosterone uh, used for in uh, bodybuilding? Can we just uh, high up the dose from TRT from uh, 200 to 300 to 500 milligrams a week and just do that as a cycle? Yes. You gotta remember, in the old days, the old days of Arnold and Sergio Oliva, he's in Cuba, uh, Bill Pearl, these guys they didn't have all the stuff that they got out of gear. They got massive and uh, just doing testosterone mega doses. Um, then again, you know, they were smoother. You remember Sergio Oliva's physique? He was huge. But he looked a little smooth, but that's all they did in the old days, just massive doses of testosterone, uh, to my knowledge. Um, 
Now, again, when I went overseas, found out what the uh, strong men were using. I strong men blew me away. I was really educated by those guys, find out what they're using. But again, yeah, testosterone can be used for pot. You know that. Of it course. And testosterone can, is the mainstay, the foundation of a bodybuilder. Much like a multivite is the foundation for good nutrition, and you build on that with other supplements. Testosterone is your foundational anabolic uh, it's been around forever. Okay. So um, let's come back to what we've already talked a bit. Uh, blasting and cruising. What is that exactly? Why do bodybuilders do that and how does it work? Well, as we said, it's a relative term. Um, blasting and cruising, it kind of supplanted the terms cycle on and cycle off. So rather than cycle on and cycle off, you call it blasting is when you stack a bunch of things to gain muscle mass and strength, but then you don't come off. You cruise, you come down to a lower dose so as not to lose some of those gains. So again, we talked about this earlier. Today, the blasting doses I'm sorry, let me back up. Today, the, a blasting dose today could be a man's cruising dose. A cruising dose today could be a man's blasting dose. So it's all relative to what you're on and what you're doing and what your goals are. So it's just a, a phrase that Dr. Uh, Thomas O'Connor likes to use. He's the anabolic doc down in, uh, now he's in Southern Florida, but he, he had a good webinar or podcast on that. And basically, he says, it's all relative now. Um, you, a blast is when you stack and you hit it hard to make your gains. And then rather than just cycle off and do PCT, they recommend that you just cruise. Again, cruising is just a term for not on great blasting doses. So it's all relative. Okay. So, um... Let's switch to the, um, okay, no, one more question. Uh, what, what's the best steroid, in your opinion, to keep the gains? Or uh, is your uh, advice, because we are not advising anything, of course, but yeah, is, yeah. What, is what one uh, can do just uh, to keep on going um, for right. extended cycles? The best uh, hormone I feel to cruise on is still testosterone. Um, the best anabolic to main to keep your gains, however, if I was to choose one, it'd be Trenbolone. Okay. I'm surprised. Main, I thought you I, would say a bull. I, I, I maintain more of my gains as a cruising dose of Trenbolone, Trenbolone acetate than I was ever to, able to maintain on a cruising dose of anything else. Okay. Very interesting to hear your experience. I think a lot of viewers will, uh, will find that as well. Okay, next thing. Um, do you have uh, any um, experience with SARMs? Personally, no. But I can tell you a story about a SARM, a very effective SARM. Matter of fact, in preparation for this talk, I did some research, and I'm very, very much intrigued uh, by Ligandrol, and I'm uh, made by the Ligand Pharmaceuticals. I think Scott Howell knows about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, there was a young man here, a very, very, very in University of Florida. I'm in, I'm in Jacksonville. I'm a Michigan boy, but hey, I live in Jacksonville now. University of Florida had a, a quarterback named Will Greer who, as a freshman, uh, led Florida to a great team. And they were winning ball games. He was a pro candidate. And even as a freshman, they knew his guys would be professional athletes. And in uh, between his freshman and sophomore year, he gained, well, rumor had it, 43 pounds. Although talking to Will, Personally, he will tell you, no, I didn't gain 43 pounds. I gained 22 pounds. 
But to gain 22 pounds in a year on Legandrol, which is a SARM, is significant. Now, at that time, it wasn't a WADA, you know, World Anti-Doping Agency. It wasn't WADA disproved or used. But, and had he probably told his coach that he was taking this, he probably would not have been excused from the team. Bottom line is, he got off it, transferred to the University of West Virginia. Now he's a professional. He got drafted last year. But that's his story. Let me tell you something about Legandrol. That's the only one I did research on because I was so amazed at hearing Will, um, Will Greer's story. Legandrol. Or Elroy knows LG60 dash or LGD, yeah, LGD for Legandro dash 4033. It's a second generation SARM. I don't really know what a first generation would be. Um, but he gained 22 pounds in a year. Now, it has great androgen receptor selectivity. It has, it's got a strong AR agonist for muscle, bone, but weak for prostate, which is good. You want to uh, have strong receptor uh, uh, agonist properties for muscle bone and, and weak for prostate, obviously. It's got a very, very safe profile in my research. No hepatotoxicity, none. It's high anabolic and low androgenic effects makes it a great SARM. Um, but you know it's downside, downside like other things that can the lipid profile. It can decrease your HDL by forty percent in just three weeks. It can decrease your HDL by forty percent in just three weeks. You gotta watch the lipid profile. Um, it's the most effective SARM. Point of my research, it is the most effective SARM. Preferred over Osterine and Andarine, which are another SARMs. I don't have any experience with them myself. Um, and it has a high oral bioavailability with 24 to 36 hour half-life. It comes in 10 mil milligram per ml oral suspension, uh, one to 10 milligram capsules. Most common side effects are minimal, just headache and dry, dry mouth. Um, it's highly suppressive of total and free T. So you can diminish your free T by 50%, I'm sorry, total T by 50%, free T by 40%, but your hormones will return to baseline without a PCT in about seven or eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Don't need PCT with this, you know, post psychotherapy. Has no visual side effects. Safe in doses up to 22 milligrams per day. I thought I got a hold of somebody, I know Will, Will Greer, he was taking about 10 milligrams a day. And you start two milligrams a day and you slowly grade, you know, go up to about 10, but you can, it's safe up to 22. Most guys taper off at 10 milligrams a day though. And you can, you, you taper up every one or two milligrams every few days, start at one or two, came up, coming up for four to eight week cycles. Um, and what, this is phenomenal too. And I want to finish on the SARM talk with this. I didn't know this. It's been shown to significantly reduce sex hormone binding globulin. So that could be used to your advantage when it comes to potentiating the effects of other stats. So having not having known this now, I think, wow, how many guys we see in this field that have a real stubborn SHBG? And given a safe profile, my gosh, I, I wish I could come across some of this and, and start you know, using it, putting it in my armamentarium. It's so safe and it's so effective for lowering SHBG. So what a great drug to add to potentiate the, effect, the effects of a stack. So again, never experienced this, Stephen. My story I'm telling you today is only because of what I read about with uh, Will Greer, who was suspended from you know, uh, college play because he admitted to taking it. They asked him, how'd you gain so much weight on the off season? Well, I did this look and draw. He was just giving me some guy in the gym. And so um, 
I like to do some more research on Legandro personally. Um, the textbook of uh, anabolic steroids, uh, textbook, textbook of anabolics by Bill Llewellyn, he has a good section there on it. I got to tell you, a lot of my research on Legandro today that I presented to you is, is come from his textbook, the 11th edition, which is replete with information regarding a lot of these substances we've discussed today. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for your medical take on uh, the SARMs and the Ligandro. So we're getting to the end. Um, so let's talk about uh, steroids combined with TRT. So I have a lot of people asking me in the comment section of my videos as well when we talk about TRT. Uh, can we combine this at low dosages continuously with anabolic steroids? So what's your opinion on that? Well, not just yes, but hell yes. It's done all the time. I mean, is this, you're asking me if we can combine anabolics with PRT, right? POT. Yes. Yes, I'm doing it right now. I'm, I'm adding low dose nandolone decanoate because of my good experiences over 20 years with it. And what Dr. You no. Know, that Dr. Uh, uh, Edward Lichten writes about in his book, that he really favors it in men over 55 years old. So currently I'm on 20 milligrams of testosterone daily with only 10 milligrams of uh, nandrolone. So I'm doing 30 milligrams a day. I am, you know, but usually in the quads or the, you know, the glutes. It's a small dose, it's, uh, you know, 30 minutes, that's just 0. 0.15 on the little BD syringes. Only problem is drawing that volume, that little syringe takes a little time, takes a few minutes, but you're patient. And I pin myself currently with uh, 20 milligrams of testosterone, 10 milligrams of nandrolone. Now, compared to the nandrolone I was taking for 20 years, that's a small dose, but that's a 70 milligrams a week. And I have noticed some strength gains in that low dose since adding it to my tot. And I've noticed the fact that, you know, at my age, I have a lot of arthritis. And I've noticed it's significantly diminished the amount of joint pains I have. Mm -hmm. Not like it did when I was taking it 100 to 200 mg or more per week. But at 70 milligrams a week, I have found that it has helped me with my knee pain in particular and my shoulder. That's exactly the answer to the question. I uh, have got uh, one of the, my viewers. So he asked, uh, can we add low doses, 50 to 100 milligrams? That's what you're doing a week of DECA for joint issues. So that's a big yes. Yes. Now, again, I'm doing it. I'm going to recommend people doing it. It's hard to get Nandolone Decanoate, though. They took it off the market in 2007, I think. Um, but I found a pharmacy in Texas. Frisco, Texas, called Drug Crafters, that makes it for a decent price. Of course, you know, if you're only doing, you know, if you're only doing 10 milligrams a day, then a, you know, a, a 200 milligram 10 ml vial can last you quite a, a bit. Mm -hmm. And that's the um, anabolic of uh, choice, the Deca. No others. That's the the one. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's my. I mean. Other than testosterone as the mainstay, my two my anabolics of choice, as I said, are Deca and Trembolone. I don't currently run Trembolone, but uh, because I was able to find a pharmacy that will compound Deca Durabone for me, mm -hmm. so I had a doctor friend write it for me. I said, "Listen, I'm only doing 70 mg a week. That's a low, isn't it?" I said, "Yeah, but I'm on top of my 20 milligrams of testosterone." Mm -hmm. So you get 30 milligrams a day is 210 for the week. Now, people have asked me, what's the ratio? If I do, you know, two to one, one to two, well, I'm, one, I'm doing two to one or one, one to two. But my point is 20 milligrams of test, 10. But I think I'm going to start doing alternate weeks where I'm going to do 10 of testosterone, 20 of nandrolone for a week or two, then flip it, and then keep doing that, see if I can maintain my gains that maybe improve my joint pain. Maybe if I go to 20 mg of nandrolone versus 10, mm -hmm. I drop the testosterone to 10 versus 20, maybe I'll have, I, I won't lose anything, but maybe I'll have more significant joint pain resolution. Yeah, okay. That's uh, a bit of experimenting still. 
Okay, one last point that you proposed yourself to talk about today. So uh, what is medical anazognosia with regards to anabolic uh, steroids and the TOT? Okay, now this is a big one. So there's a psychiatrist friend of mine, I know him very well, Dr. Peter Bregan. Brain disabling treatments in psychiatry. Intoxication and osognosia. It's called, I kind of miss, I, I call it medication because he calls it intoxication and osognosia or medication spellbinding. So, how does this relate to talk? And this is a, a this is a, an area I'm glad to talk about and it's going to increase, it's going to, it's going to ring it, it's going to resonate with a lot of guys. All right. Just like psychiatric medications, actually will have an effect on brain neurotransmitters. That's how they work, right? He mentions that there's a thing called anosognosia, where you, your personality changes so gradually, you're unaware of it. Okay, so think about this. Yeah, it's more prevalent in psychotropic drugs, obviously, but think about this. We know testosterone has psychogenic effects, physical effects, emotional effects. So how does this relate to top? Let me tell you my experience with this. Every guy out there is either, maybe I'm a presumptive here, but every guy's got a wife or girlfriend, right? Mm -hmm. And you better be careful when it comes to you doing top, or stacking, in other words, because guess what? If your wife or girlfriend finds out you're doing testosterone, anything that goes south in your relationship, any argument, any fight you get in, mm -hmm. any minimal situation of depression you may have, she's gonna blame that on your testosterone. Mm -hmm. And I had it happen to me. I had, I had, I had an ex-wife that, you know, we were going through a divorce. And things are not good when you're going through divorce. So she thought my unhappiness was due to the fact that I was on anabolic. And she took all my gear, smashed it with a hammer. <laughs> so my point is, yes, you better be careful because even though you may not notice any significant changes in your personality, and be honest, between you and I, when I was on testosterone, both tot and big doses, I felt better. I was more confident. I felt I had more initiative, more drive. I was not, a, I was not aggressive. So guys who are aggressive, period, if they're on testosterone, they may become more aggressive. Guys who are laid back, good personalities, they don't become aggressive, in my opinion. But this whole thing about intoxication um, in the anosognosia is be aware that any slight difference in your personality is going to be attributed to you doing testosterone by your wife or girlfriend. So you better watch out for that because she will blame that medication. Even just physiological dosing, you'll get blamed for anything, that, any argument, any fight you get in, any anytime you get depressed about anything, she's gonna blame that. So you really have to be careful with this stuff because it will be the fall. She'll find some reason to blame your unhappiness, the marital discord, anything on the fact that you're doing taught. Mm -hmm. She will use that against you. Mm -hmm. See my point? So even though I don't think it changes personalities much like does you know psychotropics. But it may be such a gradual change in your personality that you're not aware of it. And she's aware of it. And she will hone in on that mm -hmm. and make your life miserable. You'll have to justify why you're doing tot. And she will try to have you stop it if she thinks it's changing your personality. And she will hone in on your personality changes mm -hmm. and blame anything she can on testosterone. So be careful. Is any change in your personality, your girlfriend or wife will attribute that to testosterone. 
so Seriously. I've experienced it, and guys put me all the time with you. I understand, and I can concur. But what do you propose then to do that all uh, a bit secretly? Well, I just here's my propose. Here's my here's my propose. One, you better make sure that you treat your wife or girlfriend special, special, special. Meaning, don't take a bad day at work and come home and kick the dog. Make sure you think twice about getting in an argument with her because you want to maintain a good relationship with your girlfriend and wife. And so she's not thinking that these, your, your Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde thing is caused by this. I mean, again, you know, we all have bad days. We have days where we're down. We have days where we're dejected. We have days where we might get in an argument. I mean, every marriage goes through that. Mm -hmm. But if you want to maintain testosterone optimization, you better work real hard on making sure that you don't bring any ill feelings, animosities, hate, just to get home to your marriage or girlfriend. She mm -hmm. will blame that on the testosterone. I'm telling you right now, it happened to me. I've got all kinds of patients coming to me and say, man, doc, I feel great, man. But well, my wife and I got in an argument the other day, just routine argument. We've been, uh, she said I want, she wanted me to come off that testosterone. Mm -hmm. Tell her. People, no matter if they're on testosterone or not, they're going to have some, some spats. It's just part of life. Mm -hmm. And I apologize, honey, for coming home, bring, you know, and bringing this home. I'm human. I apologize. But you're going to have to back step a lot. Mm -hmm. If she's gonna, if you're gonna come home with bad attitude, mm -hmm. and do you think pay the price? She may, she may throw your gear away and break it, demolish it with a hammer. Mm -hmm. Happened to me. <laughs> and do you think that's more of a problem in um, the usage like, of anabolic be steroids? Be careful of subtle changes in your personality you might not be aware of. Mm -hmm. Pardon me. Pardon do you me? think that's more of a problem in anabolic? Do you think that's more of a problem in anabolic you're steroids? Breaking. Done in TOT? I I don't think so. I mean, obviously, I mean, you see, the change of personality is not not as well documented as changes in personality when it comes to these, you know, psychotropics, mm -hmm. especially SSRIs and a, or the other ones like Abilify. I'm just saying, as it occurs in psychiatry, it can occur in this field. Mm -hmm. And if your girlfriend and wife knows, and I said, I'm, I'm a broken record here, but if she knows you're on this stuff, she's going to have your behaviors under a magnifying glass. Anything are the norm, even yeah. though it just could be regular stresses of life. Mm -hmm. She can blame it on testosterone. She will try to get you to come off it. I've seen it. I patients come to me all the time. Dog, I'm feeling great, man, but my wife's convinced that my personality is changing. I don't think it is. She thinks, she thinks it is. They're just looking for it. Mm -hmm. My point? That's a very good point. It's and an important I think, one. You yeah. want me to test out? You want me to test out much of your life and get the benefits? You better make sure you don't take any animosity or anger home routinely. Because she will blame that your personal life changes on testosterone. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying, you'll you'll lose her. You'll lose it. I've seen divorces occur. Mm -hmm. This guy who wanna remain on top. And she says, me or Todd? Mm -hmm. And he says, Todd. Or he says, okay, you, honey. But he goes outside the marriage and does it. He takes his Todd at work, you know, or he takes it at where place. He hides it. And she finds out. And all hell breaks loose. Great advice. This is an important topic. Yeah, it is. That's uh, a you topic better. we have to share with our uh, HOT group. Yes. Oh, for sure. Mm hmm So I'm telling you right now, you got what you know. Your other half is going to keep your behavior on their magnifying glass. She's going to dissect it, and everything that she does not like about you that day, that week, she's going to say, "You've changed mm -hmm. since you've been on that testosterone." Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can. Uh... Even though you haven't, you said no. You just you just look for something to, to blame mm -hmm. this spat on. And don't you think some men, um, once they get on testosterone, they, uh, they, they get better, they feel better, and the relationship improves? Isn't that another possibility? Yes, yes, it can. But like anything else, life is not 
euphoric all day. It's not a you know a, a utopia. I mean, you're gonna even if that's the case for a man and she's happy with it. What if they get in a fight or he steps out on time? Mm -hmm. She's gonna blame that on his rare sex drive and testosterone, mm -hmm. and she will make him come off it. Don't be doing that, guys. Okay. Doing that. Thank you so much for right. all the great make sure advice. You, you, love your, you make sure you love your wife or girlfriend and stroke them extra extra special. Mm -hmm. If you have to, write a logbook so you can prove to her. Uh, listen, look it. I told you I love you every day here for a hundred straight days. I come home, I had a bad day, didn't tell you I loved you. And now you tell me my personality has changed because of testosterone. Uh, no, honey, not at all. I had a bad day. Sorry. Mm -hmm. it, it's important. It Very is. important. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. We have been talking for an hour and 50 minutes. So, uh, a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience that you shared with us. Thank you so much. And uh, well, the, most, the most exciting thing I want to talk about, Steve, today, to be honest, not was that intoxication and anosognosia because it's a fancy term, it's big in psychiatry, but I'm relating it to top. Mm -hmm. Because I've seen it ruin relationships and marriages. Okay, it's late there, I guess, isn't it? Late. It's getting late here. Uh, it's a quarter to eleven in the evening. Yeah. I'm in bed at nine o'clock, so I'm, we are way past my bedtime here. Okay, so let's uh, end this uh, interview. Thank you so much for the podcast, Jeffrey, for your uh, knowledge, and talk to you next time. Bye bye. Looking forward to it, Stephen. Bye. Bye-bye.